Today we are going to paint a little landscape which is a lot easier than you might think from looking at this um, tryout that I have already done. It's not difficult and there's lots and lots of techniques to learn from having a go at this painting. Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Diane and my passion is painting and creating nature-inspired watercolours in my studio, which are easy for you to do too. I share all my paintings with you on YouTube and on our website, dianeanton.com, you can find free downloadable sketches for all the videos to help you make the most of your painting journey. And if you'd like a little bit more, we also have channel memberships with loads of perks for you to enjoy. So welcome on board, click subscribe and turn on notifications and let's learn to paint watercolour. I'm going to be using um, a piece of paper which is approximately A4 size, that's about 8 by 12 inches. Uh, this is an etcher pad or block. It's a block because it's glued all the way around, as I've said many times before, on all four sides, so that when you use it to do a wet in wet um, section of your painting, like we will do for the sky, it doesn't cockle or buckle, it just holds tight all the way around the edges. So it saves you having to um, stretch your paper using tape or even doesn't work so well, but sometimes people stick them down with, stick the paper down with masking tape, but that never works all that well, I don't think. So this is, this is a good way of doing it if you're going to use any wet in wet process at all. Um, so that's the paper. This is 140 pound cold press paper, which has a slight texture to it, but not very much. It's, um, it's quite a soft texture. And I will be using two brushes for this and possibly a rigger. I may or may not use my rigger. So that's a large round. This one is a size 11 and this one is a size 7. And this is a rigger, which is, this one happens to be a size 4 um, or anything like a 2, 3 or 4 rigger will do. Or if you've got a one of these, um, uh, what do you call it? This is a sword liner. They're quite good for doing branches and um, twigs and things like that if you happen to have one. But Never fear, if you don't have that and you don't have that, it doesn't matter because you can do it all with this. So that's that's my brushes there. I'm going to be using a piece of candle to um, help me with the trees to give this kind of um, uh, roughened effect. That there is going to be that. Um, and the colours I'm going to use, I will be using my large palette today, which is my butcher's tray. And I generally use this for landscapes because it gives me much more scope for mixing colours. Um, and on here, I have got everything that I will need. Um, I'm going to be using, um, I'll just run through the colours that we're going to be using. For the sky, for the, for the yellowy sort of bottom part of the sky, I can use either yellow ochre, Naples yellow or raw sienna for that part then I'm going to use either um, ultramarine or cobalt blue or cerulean blue for the um, blue part of the sky. That will be up here. I think I used cerulean in this one because I think cerulean is a slightly more wintry blue. Uh, ultramarine tends to be a little bit more summery and cobalt is somewhere in between. Not everyone has cobalt blue either, but most people have got cerulean and ultramarine. So if you're going to choose between those and you want a more wintry look, then go for the cerulean, I think. Um, and then I'm also going to be using uh, some green. And I think I used olive green, but you could also use sap green or hooker's green. And you're going to mix that with a little bit of uh, blue or gray. And for the gray, you're going to have to find neutral tint or Payne's gray or black, or even um, you could mix a uh, grey from one of your greens with a red, with a dark red. That will give you a grey as well. Um, and then for the berries on here, a red and or a purple, so cadmium red, for example, and Windsor purple, Windsor violet would do fine. And for the fox and some of this warmth down here, um, I think that um, burnt sienna is the colour to use for that. So there we are. That's everything you need. Now, what I did do was I have already traced this 
And um, this is a trick for making life easier for yourself. If you do a painting and you like it in general, you like the design that you've done, the drawing and so on and so forth, but you're a bit worried about perhaps the way it turned out, but you want to do it again, why not get some tracing paper, trace it, and then transfer the tracing onto your paper. You can use a light box for that, or if you just go over the back of it with a soft pencil and then just, you know, use pencil like carbon paper, and then you can just transfer the drawing from the tracing paper onto the watercolour paper. So you could do that. Um, if you're more confident with your drawing, of course, you can just quickly do the sketch again, but it is a way of saving time as well. So I will probably do that. Um, and uh, then we will start the painting. So I'm going to turn you off for a second. I'll be back in two shakes of a lamb's tail and uh, we'll get started. Okay, so I've got my little drawing drawn out now and um, you can download the sketch for this from the website dianantoncom for free. No charge for that, unless you feel like leaving us a tip, um, but absolutely free for those of you who um, want to try to use the sketch instead of drawing it yourself. So, you know, sometimes you just want to go ahead and paint, don't you? You don't want to bother with drawing. Um, okay, so the first step, having drawn it, um, I've got a, a piece of candle here. This is just an ordinary candle. There's the wick in the middle there. I've sort of sharpened it a little bit. And I'm just going to use that to go over uh, the main trunk of the trees. And the idea of that is that it's going to give me a little bit of um, light reflecting as if there was snow kind of on the tree trunks. And it's it's an easier way. You can do dry brush technique if you want to as well but this if you happen to have that or you can use a obviously a white crayon or you could use a little bit of masking fluid if you wanted to mask out the trees as well so you can do any of those things but I thought I would do it that way it's a nifty trick works quite well it has a uh, quite a good effect um, now for the light in the sky behind the hill line um, I'm going to use I think Naples yellow so I'll just Mix that up, but very, very, <coughs> excuse my voice, um, very thinly. Don't want it too thick. Don't want it too dark. And the paper is dry. And you can see the horizon line there behind those trees. And um, I'm just going to go in there very lightly uh, with this colour. You don't want it too dark because obviously the sky in the winter is, um, well, I'm talking Northern Hemisphere, I'm talking Europe here. And uh, I know I can't, I, I can't, I, I can't really paint other parts of the world very convincingly because I'm here, not there. And this is the way it is here, I guess. So excuse me for that. So that's that's the, the light in the sky, and then we want some cerulean. So I'll just, oopsie, get another little dish. And it's quite nice this way, you can see whether you've got it the right intensity. And then I'm just going to come in at the top and uh, just bring in some blue. And if you, if you do it in broken strokes like this, it's much more convincing because, okay, it's possible that in some parts of the world, the sky is a flat blue color all the time, but um, I think you need to look a little bit more carefully and remember that you're not painting the side of a garage. You're painting something which is fluid in motion and alive. So you none of this business, N not in my, not in my world anyway. So it's up to you, of course, but this is just the way I do it. Okay, now um, behind the trees, we have a line of hills here, and we're going to want some nice light grayish, pinkish, I think. So just here on my butcher's tray, I've got some colors that I'd mixed up earlier. This, I don't know what it is, it's probably um, a little bit of grey and a little bit of mauve, I don't know, but it's a nice colour for the distance. 
So that's the benefit of having um, using this butcher's tray idea because you've got a whole um, range of colours available to you without having to mix up every single individual one as you go along. And um, you'd be surprised how beneficial that is. So we're just putting in the, the, the light uh, grey of the distant hills there. And then coming a bit closer, we just pick up something a tiny bit darker. And we are imagining here now some slightly closer hills and going to mix the colour up, just picking up different greys in a more or less random fashion. And then we'll stop there because we've got snow coming up. So that's that bit. And then I'm going to look for some greens for these trees. And the way I'm going to paint these um, today is I'm going to mix up a, a sludgy sort of green like that and then I'm just going to not worry about it running because like I said these things are alive and they're constantly moving so just this is the undercoat so to speak so there you do have a similarity to when you're painting the side of the house um, you do need an undercoat and We'll make them different, slightly different colours. And then we'll let that dry and then we'll come in and we'll do a sort of top coat. So the further away they go, the more bluish they get. Okay, that's called aerial perspective. As things go away from you, they become bluish. So we'd have that. And we can, you know, alter the shape of it a little bit um, when it's dry. And if you feel that your run up here is undesirable, just use a tissue. Everyone should always have a tissue at hand. Just use a tissue. And if I wasn't doing this for the video, I would probably have waited. Um, for the background to dry before I came in with the trees, but it's no big deal. Okay, so having done that, I'm going to let this bit dry before I start to paint the tree, uh, the trees, and I need to let this bit dry before I paint the slightly more foreground trees. Um, but what I can do next, I'm going to swap to a smaller brush and um, I'll turn my paints around a bit. And I'm just going to pick up some brownish colour. I remember I mentioned burnt sienna. And uh, we'll just knock that back a little bit with a bit of green that's hanging around there. And we'll just put in some, some warmth just here. And then maybe a little bit here. Because in the original drawing, I had a, a fence going up over there. So then we might soften down the lines a little bit on one side, doing a bit of lost and found. The found is where the line is sharp and the lost is where it's softened. OK. And um, what I'm going to have to do here now is I'm going to have to get my hairdryer out and dry it. So that's dry now and um, we can do some work on the trees. Now we did say uh, that we would probably use neutral tint or Payne's grey or um, black even. Um, I'm going to go for the neutral tint. Um, whoops. I'm going to go for the neutral tint because it's a softer dark, it's like almost brown, and I think that's probably going to work a bit better than Payne's Grey, but it wouldn't matter. So then we're going to paint over our wax. 
first of all. And we get we get a light and a dark side. And the same on this one. It's quite an effective method of painting trees and you can make it darker in places if you want just by dropping in more paint on that side. And then we'll be going to put in other branches. Using the point of the brush, you could use a rigger, but if you've got a nice sharply pointed round brush about this size, which is five, I think, seven, um, the point of the brush should do the trick. Okay, and then in the background here, using the same colour, we can put in here, for example, a nice row of under uh, little trees, little bushes. Take it behind this tree and if you use a little bit of brown as well as your neutral tint, you're going to get a nice contrast. Okay, and then we might want to put another layer in here of trees. And that will give us a, a little bit of a three-dimensional effect, okay? Um, and then while we've still got this colour, we're going to make this a bit bluer. And pick up some blue from the palette, make this a little bit bluer, and then we'll think about bringing some shadows in from the trees. And then maybe a bit of shadow on the underneath of these trees too. But what I want next is to take green and uh, mix up some green and then come in and do wet on dry. these trees. If you want to make it a bit greyer, just add a bit more neutral tint. That's what that paint colour is for. You can pop some of that in here too if you want. Just keep it nice and broken. Maybe a bit more blue-ish, green, perhaps a bit of turquoise, because this one is a bit turquoise isn't it? It's gone a bit blue because it's in the distance. I didn't do it, but you could, if you wanted to, add um, snow if you want. That will dry a little bit lighter than it looks at the moment. So you can take that into consideration when you're doing, uh, when you're doing a watercolour. And I think we had a fence here, didn't we? So we'll just pop in the fence line there. I will be coming back to these trees shortly. Um, Put a little bit of snow shadow 
in here just to give me a little bit more uh, form to the painting. Okay, um, now the trees. I think, I think we were working mostly with neutral tint for the branches. So this is neutral tint again. And this is, this is just a little bit painstaking because painstaking, if you're using Payne's gray, it will be painstaking, ha ha. So we're just going to drop in the branches. Remember to make them overlap. Remember to make them nice and fine. As fine as you can. and so on and so forth. What's difficult, one of the things that's difficult about watercolour painting is looking at the whole picture while you're doing it and not concentrating on just one element of it. And I find that the hardest is to see the whole thing overall. I think when you get the hang of that, which I haven't yet, really, I don't think. When you when you can see in your mind's eye, I don't have very good imagination in, in the sense of, you know how when you do um, uh, guided meditations or something, and they say, imagine yourself on the beach, imagine yourself walking through the sand, and in the distance you can see a ball of light coming towards you, and I can't, <laughs> I try. But I can't. I can't imagine stuff like that. I can I can imagine the words. I can sort of um, tell myself that I can see a ball of light coming towards me or that a pillar of white light is coming down and landing on my head. And, and so I can tell myself that, but I can't actually see it. And that, of course, is a bit of a disadvantage for an artist not to be able to see the painting that they're going to create. So those of you who do have good visual imagination, you are very blessed because it makes a huge difference. I've had to try to train myself to imagine things and it's not easy. <laughs> There's a word for it, this, um, this inability to see things in your head. Apparently, some people think everyone can do it, and some people think nobody can. And yeah, it's interesting. I expect some of you have heard of this. I can't remember what it's called now. It's it's like the opposite to having an uh, what do you call it? Um, eidetic memory when you can remember everything you see. Tamsin used to be a bit like that. She used to be able to remember. Um, what was in a book on a certain page. She says she can't anymore now, not really. Obviously getting old. <laughs> I, I could never do that. Not really. Yeah, I can remember the words to a song, and yet I can't remember the words to a poem. We're funny, aren't we, people? Okay, so I think I think that's probably enough branches. I'm getting bored with this. <laughs> um, when do you stop? When do you know your painting's finished? In my opinion, it's when you're bored with it. So I'm going to do the rabbits now. So we have some ears on this rabbit here, and then we we'll give him a little face. And this one's going to be a bit greyer.
great concentration and biting of tongues and so on. And then the fox. Um, he's going to be nice brown colour. Don't need too much water for him. So. I'm, I'm actually using Venetian red here. I was supposed to be using um, burnt sienna. The Venetian red's too opaque. Burnt sienna is a more uh, transparent color. So that's better, really. And I'll just use a little bit of very, very pale grey to indicate the end of his tail there. And he needs a shadow underneath him, of course. So do the bunny rabbits. When they're dry, we'll put in their eyes. Now, um, there's a couple more things need to be done. I need to do some dry brush work for the uh, twig, tiny twigs. Tiny twigs. So, um, using this area here where I've got all this light gray, I'm just going to pick up a little bit of light grey and brush sideways like that. And I need to just test it on the back of the other painting to make sure I'm going to get a dry brush effect. And then we're just going to try very, to do very lightly. If it doesn't work, then we just brush it with a finger. In fact, I think it could be said that a combination of finger and brush is probably the best. And this is just, just to give you some idea of um, the tiny br branches that are up there in these oak trees. And as the brush gets drier, obviously, don't add any more water, just keep scumbling away. Okay, that's not quite dry yet. I'm going to bring in some, some real darks there, some darker darks. Like this. But I won't bore you with that. I'll do that at the end. Because the next thing is these branches and these thingy what's it's at the beginning at the front here. And I might try to show you how to use this... Uh, um, sword liner. Um, they're worth having if you if you do a lot of undergrowth and and so on. So we will find our um, neutral tint again, and then I'm just going to put in some long, fine calligraphic strokes like this. It's just a little bit easier than using the point of a round brush, but you can use the point of a round brush too if you want. You just get something a little bit more exciting here. If you can relax into it, which, uh, and then just, you can go like that. You can get some slight darks. Just drop in some more darks down the bottom there. And then having done that, we need a small brush. No, I think smaller than that. I'm going to break my own rule and use a, a little brush. I don't like little brushes because they don't hold any water. And just pick up some dark red and drop in some berries.
You could do it with spatter if you wanted to. You don't have to do them individually. You could spatter. It depends how big your painting is. If you've done a biggish one rather than this little baby painting, then you might want to do spatter. Um, then I want to make the others kind of mauve. There's lots of different ways that you could do this, but I think the berries are just, I just add a little bit of contrast over here. And then maybe I'll use the small brush. I don't think this is quite dry yet. Um, I think I'm going to have to get my hair dryer out. Okay, so I'm just going to um, put in the eyes. You could use a pen for this um, if you're worried at all about uh, the sharpness of your brush, but I'm just going to give him a nice black nose and a little eye. Not going to do anything terribly spectacular there, but that's that's just enough really. And then I'll probably use a pencil to do the um, whiskers. Just trying to put in, I think foxes often have little black tips to their ears and um, paws and stuff. Anyway, so that, that'll do. And let's give the bunnies a nose as well. Try and keep that really tiny. Okay. Um, right, so I don't know if we want a few larger berries on here, maybe It'll make it look a little bit better, perhaps. You could put in some more, if you wanted to, you could put in some tree trunks in the distance if you feel that you would be able to see them or that it would add to the painting, which is possible. Again, it all comes down to being able to imagine what it's going to look like if you do make a change. And uh, sometimes tracing paper can help with that. Um, this I wanted to be a little bit warmer. I'm not quite sure what this is supposed to represent, this warmth here, but I just kind of thought that it was otherwise going to be too cold. And I might have a little... Um, foray into snow on these trees. I'm using um, Dr. P.H. Martin's Bleed Proof White for this, everybody's favourite. And uh, the reason for doing that, which I didn't do on the original, is because I think this is quite a light toned paint, painting, but the trees have come out a little bit darker than I perhaps wanted. So I'm going to give them some snow to lighten the tone a little bit. It's always good to lighten the tone, isn't it? So there we are. I think that's pretty much done. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed that and learned something from that. Quite a lot of techniques in there, but it's not a difficult painting. And uh, I know that uh, you ladies out there are going to have a go at this one and you're going to make it into something absolutely spectacular. So there we are. One winter landscape with fox and two rabbits. Um, a bear pair of trees and some berries. So please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed that. 
Don't forget to visit us at dianeanton.com for your free sketch downloads. And please don't forget to sign up for Patreon to support us starting at $2.99 a month. You can have a serious effect on how our channel develops if you go over there. And also, I think I said this the other day, we're starting to upload all of our um, uh, videos, which are going to remain here on YouTube. But if you belong to Patreon, you'll be able to watch them free of ads, which is quite nice if you belong to the top two tiers in Patreon. So I think that's enough wittering and I'll see you again soon. So I'll say bye bye for now, everybody. Bye bye.